Chicago. Oh, boa tarde. Okay, that's the end of my uh, Portuguese for today. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank As Esper and the other organizers for inviting me here to Brazil. I've had many uh, great trips down here, and it's always a, a wonderful occasion to join the course and to uh, provide some hopefully new and exciting areas of uh, investigation in HIV pathogenesis. Uh, I'm going to talk today on the uh, human microbiome, which I think is getting a lot more interest in the field of uh, HIV pathogenesis. Certainly, it, if you can't read an, uh, an issue of science or nature without seeing an article on the microbiome in a variety of areas and a variety of fields, so I think it's really time has come for applying more of the role of the microbiome in, um, in HIV. And I'll be talking also about how we're applying this in therapeutic lessons. Um, this is a, a review from Immunity from 2013. Uh, Steve Deeks is the uh, first author, but our senior author is sitting with us today, Dr. Duek, who is, he can raise his hand. Um, anyways, it's a uh, wonderful opportunity, I think, any of you who want to really learn more about the role of uh, immunity and consequences of translocation. This is a great review from a few years ago. But I just bring it up to show you that HIV uh, targets the gut, and we've shown that in many studies uh, over the last uh, 15 or 20 years um, to really show that the, the virus goes there initially through whatever route of infection in both uh, pathogenic studies in monkeys and in the human studies, that it really targets the gut. And uh, one of the questions is why it targets the gut is that that is really the highest concentration of the uh, HIV uh, targets uh, for the virus in the lymphocytes, the CD4, CCR5 positive cells are there. Once targeting the virus to the gut, we then undergo uh, mucosal disruption, and the microbial products then go out to the systemic circulation throughout the immune system, and then also up potentially into the uh, CNS, uh, causing a variety of complications and, and inflammatory damage. Also, another organ, I know we're maybe not talking much about this, but would say to Esper for future discussions, the liver is becoming a much more relevant organ in HIV pathogenesis, and a lot more interest is coming up in the liver. And I would really recommend a discussion at this group on the liver and some of the outcomes. I think now when we're treating hepatitis C effectively with our new uh, agents, direct-acting antivirals, that HIV in the liver is going to become a much more important organ to study as well. And, of course, the... Uh, the uh, aspects of microbial translocation are important here, especially for altering uh, coagulation that's being studied. And on the other side, we have the activation effects on the monocyte macrophage. We're very interested in that cell, although I won't comment on that. Um, I know there'll be more about uh, the role of inflammation and, and outcomes related to that from uh, Dr. Letterman's talk uh, next week in relation to cardiovascular disease. And what we are looking at here are these uh, effects of, of atherosclerosis vascular dysfunction, and eventually leading to multimorbidity and aging. And this is what we're dealing with in HIV, is a disease related to aging. And I think we can begin to think about the gut and its role in this area, but it's not just in the aging effects. It's also, as we've heard from a number of talks uh, today, on, on regard to uh, the cure research agenda and what we're doing there in terms of outcomes uh, related to that as well. Um, when we look at the gut, just to remind folks, this is a big piece of real estate, and when you study the GI tract, it's all about, as we say in real estate, location, location, location. And um, this really has raised the question about how do we study the human microbiome. I think that is still an area of discussion of where do we sample. Can we do this simply by taking fecal material from our patients? Uh, can we do this by rectal swabs? Do we have to do biopsies? Do we have to do sigmoidoscopy or even colonoscopy or endoscopy? So I think these are great questions for groups here to start to think about and hopefully to begin, begin to gather some basic data. And as we look across um, the actual GI tract, we have, and you'll remember, you're more microbial cells than you are human cells, which is one of those fun facts you can use at your next uh, cocktail parties here in, in Brazil. When you're having a caipirinha later tonight, you can you know, amaze your friends and relatives with those facts. Uh, we also know that it's also affected by diet, and that's an important part of all of our current studies is to get more information and better information about nutrition. 
I also would point out that the lowest concentration of your microbiome is actually in your ileum and jejunum, in your small intestine, whereas the largest, up to 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 12th bacteria, are found in your colon. So again, where there's a different metabolic outcome, and we heard from Mario Ostrowski this morning about metabolism from the host side, but we cannot neglect metabolism from the bacterial side, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my talk, but I think that's an important area of investigation as well. One of the first studies that we participated in was in collaboration with Carol Wilson's group, published uh, a year ago now, or two years ago, in mucosal immunology. And this is looking at uh, alterations in the colonic mucosa. So in, this was a case where we actually did uh, biopsy the patients and look at uh, biopsy material and fecal material uh, in untreated. So these were untreated patients with HIV who were uh, viremic. And what we found in these initial studies was a dysbiosis uh, that really related to uh, changes in an increase in bacteria reported, well, that were more pathobionts that belonged to the Prevotaliaceae family, and a decrease in bacteria here with uh, anti-inflammatory property bringing to the family of Firmicutes, known to contain species of bacteria important in producing short-chain fatty acids. So that's an important part of today's discussion is the relative change in the bacterial uh, fa uh, family, species, and genus within the gut related to their abilities to make these important regulatory factors known as short-chain fatty acids that can affect the host metabolic pathways and then uh, contribute uh, it with their lack to inflammatory outcomes, as I'll uh, show you later in some more detailed data. What we've also done in these uh, initial studies is to look at the associations with uh, immune parameters. And we're able to show here in these initial studies that there was a strong positive uh, direct correlation with plasma LPS levels, uh, activated CD4 and CD8 cells within the colon, increased uh, interferon gamma uh, colonic CD8 cells, activated colonic dendritic cells, uh, and activated blood uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells. We also showed negative associations with colonic Th22 cells, which trended uh, at 0.05. So there, again, was more activation and loss of important cells, the Th22 cells, which are cells important in maintaining through the production of IL-22 uh, gut uh, mucosal uh, barrier integrity. Um, and this was based, again, on, on principal uh, component analysis with looking at the presence of the different uh, bacteria and these outcomes, but I'll drill down more in those data. And this just shows you looking at the relative abundance of Prevotella, percent of the total bacteria, uh, looking again here at the, um, the numbers of the activated uh, CD4 cells and CD8 cells here uh, in the uninfected and the infected subjects, and then here correlating it with a, a fairly high degree of significance, a positive correlation with increasing activation among both the CD4 and the CD8 T cells and the presence then of the Prevotella. And, and we've uh, dug down more into the genus and then the species of Prevotella that are present in these patients that may be uh, linked to this. Um, what we've shown in these first initial studies is that the mucosal microbiome in untreated subjects was characterized by increases in Prevotella species and proteobacteria and decreases in bacteroides and firmicutes. We did find, and I'm, I'm not going to show the data, it was in that publication, that we found some more significant differences in mucosa so that the, uh, the actual change in the bacteria was greater in the mucosa than the stool. So this does raise the question about the kinds of sampling one does and, and reports on in the various studies if one sees or does not see significant uh, changes um, in the microbiome. We also showed HIV associated was linked to microbial translocation and mucosal and systemic T cell activation. And the, um, the increased Prevotella abundance was most closely associated. So we think this change and altered uh, in, in terms of the diversity is the contributing factor here, or at least one of the factors that might be responsible. One of the other important aspects, as I mentioned, is the loss of the short-chain fatty acid producers. Um, and short-chain fatty acids are very important in gut homeostasis. 
Um, they're made predominantly in the large bowel, as you can see, or the large intestine. They're metabolic products of dietary fiber, fermentation by anaerobic bacteria. So these are being made depending on what you eat, and I'm not sure what everybody ate here for lunch, but we could uh, check you later on and see what your short-chain fatty acid content is. I don't know if Esper's willing to collect stools on all of his uh, colleagues today and take them to the lab. Um, Esper, is that something you're willing to do? I, I, I take that laugh as a yes, and so any volunteers, please see Esper at the end of this session. Um, we're also important, the fact is they are cellular nutrients. Um, one of the interesting features of these is that they're HDAC inhibitors, and we've heard a lot about HDAC inhibitors, the histone deacetylase inhibitors, as aspects of the, um, uh, in terms of the kick and kill strategies of driving out latent virus. And I know uh, this has been looked at before in some studies on butyrate activating latent virus, but it really hasn't moved forward in terms of the role of these bacterial products in, in the uh, more HIV activations. They also act against the GPCR uh, receptors and they regulate lipid and glucose metabolism. So I think, again, an important aspect of how this might be important in immune metabolism. Uh, the human gut contains acetate, propionate, and butyrate are the three major short-chain fatty acid. And uh, the butyrate is probably the most important in terms of its immune regulatory properties. And this is, again, a, a summary just showing you that it's your dietary fiber. So again, I think everybody says, make sure you have a lot of fiber in your diet. That's what drives uh, this microbiome then to make the butyrate uh, to act. The major receptor for butyrate is the GPCR109A receptor. And so this receptor is found on your epitheliums, and it's also on your immune cells, so it can activate through and, act and have an effect on the gut epithelium. I think that's, again, another area of investigation that a lot of the field hasn't really thought about, is that the epithelial surface in the gut is also immunologically active. A lot of cytokines, antimicrobial peptides, a lot of other features, can, other factors can be made by the epithelium and is the area that's directing contact with the host microbiome. I think, again, it's a rich area for further investigation in this field of, of HIV. We also know then that this, uh, these butyrates uh, mo molecules can interact with dendritic cells, driving them to the uh, tolerogenic DCs through making IL-10 and then driving uh, naive T cells to Tregs, which we've talked about. So here's another uh, pathway that we've talked about also with the role of TGF-beta and IL-18 drive driven through butyrate. So I think this is another potential pathway through some of the work that uh, Dr. Sekely spoke about yesterday in terms of the role of Tregs and IL-10. There may be another role one could start to think about through uh, butyrate production as well. So this is a summary from that initial paper where we looked at the ratio of Prevotella to the total butyrate-producing bacteria. And there's a, a very significant increase in terms of that ratio. It, it's almost a, a one, two, three, four, five, five log difference in terms of the ratio. So there's a significant change clearly in the ratio of the Prevotella to the butyrate-producing bacteria in these HIV patients. We've also, as I mentioned, shown that the Prevotella ratio is associated inversely with Th17, Th22 depletion, two important T cell populations involved in making cytokines important in maintaining barrier integrity uh, function and activity, and then also a positive association with activation here of, of colonic myeloid dendritic cells measured by uh, CD40. So this really links the changes in the bacterial uh, populations to mucosal T cell depletion. Um, then what we're also interested in, in terms of how we might use and use these short chain fatty acids, and I'll come back to that later as well, but they are immunomodulatory uh, metabolites that can have a direct effect on T cells. They can suppress T cell activation, production of T cell uh, inflammatory cytokines. Um, they can also produce colonic regulatory T cell differentiation. Um, and this still, I think, is controversial in terms of are T regs good for you or bad for you in HIV? I think it, the answer is it depends and the circumstances are, are relevant. What we've worked on with Carol Wilson and Steph Dillon in Colorado is the development of an in vitro assay. In this case, we're doing an assay with uh, lamina propria mononuclear cells. So these are cells taken directly from gut tissue resections uh, where we set up uh, cultures where we're able to infect with HIV and then add in the pathobiont here, the Prevotella species, uh, along with butyrate in order to look at the modulation in this uh, in vitro culture system. 
And these initial studies, what we were able to show is a particular Prevotella, Prevotella stercoriae, induces CD4 T cell activation and enhances uh, as well uh, T cell infection. So this is HIV bowel alone in these LPMCs. And then we've added in the uh, bacterial uh, species here to show an enhancement in this in vitro culture system. Uh, we can also show uh, that's, I'm sorry, this is activation here. This is the infection study here uh, measured by intracellular P24. So again, the, uh, there's an activation and enhanced infection with the presence of this pathobiont. Uh, when we then in vitro add high doses of butyrate to this system, we can show then a reduction of T cell activation uh, in, in the system as well as reduction uh, with two millimolar, which can be equivalent to what you might be able to find in a healthy uh, GI tract uh, reduction in, in P24 expression in the uh, CD8 negative, which would be the CD4 positive T cells. So we think then that there may be a role or potential role for butyrate in, in therapeutic applications, although this hasn't been tried, uh, and I'll talk about it at the end when we talk about pre- and probiotics. This is called a postbiotic. So one, and there are studies outside of the HIV field that are ongoing in the allergy uh, work in Australia that I'm aware of, where they're actually treating now with butyrate directly to modulate the, the gut microbiome uh, in, in those patients. So what we've seen then in this system is that in an ex vivo model uh, that we can study the butyrate interactions in this intestinal cell assay, which we think is more biologically relevant directly using uh, lamina propria cells. The pathobiont uh, enhances T cell cytokine production activation and infection. Also, data I didn't show you, myeloid uh, dendritic cell activation. High doses of butyrate uh, in, reduce the activation and the infection, and low doses fail to inhibit. So it, again, it may be a dose-related effect and something that we can consider in the future because these types of therapeutics are available and are being used in other fields as well. So our, our current model in this regard is that we see that the infection of HIV in the gut causes alterations in the gut epithelium barrier, leading to the Prevotella activation potentially along with HIV-1, activating the myeloid dendritic cells. We have a loss then of the regulatory uh, butyrate-producing bacteria, lack of the or reduction of the short-chain fatty acids. This is data that we're now generating directly on stool samples to show the metabolomic profiles that are present in our stool. This leads to then the activated DCs producing the cytokines and inflammatory mediators, CD4 CD T cell expansion activation and depletion. This is what would happen in the uh, untreated uh, HIV setting. Now the question is what happens when we look at patients on therapy? Uh, this is a follow-up study from our group in Chicago, published as well last, uh, two years ago in PLOS Pathogen, um, looking at the, look at the human microbiome in patients who are on suppressed regimens with uh, good CD4 T cell uh, responses. And we saw, again, very similar uh, uh, differences, and again, in the Prevotella uh, species here in, in between the controls and the HIV positives, and then also a significant loss in the bacteroides. Uh, species. So uh, two independent cohorts, both of these were analyzed by two different groups in terms of the informatics and the sequencing, but similar data, and there have been at least two or three other studies that have shown very similar data. Again, decrease in bacterial species in terms of the diversity capable of, of anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acid production. So we think this does have relevance in terms of the potential pathogenesis and in terms of reconstitution. We've also linked directly uh, through an array platform, mucosal cytokine mRNA, and what we're able to show, again, in the uh, total gut tissues using a uh, bead array and Luminex platform, an increase in inflammatory markers correlated with reduced bacteroides. Um, and again, looking at this, this was control in HIV positives for IL-1 beta, IL-6, IL-8, and interferon gamma all elevated in terms of the fold change difference in correlation with the loss of bacteroides. So again, there's a direct uh, link here. And these are all patients on suppressive antiretroviral therapy uh, with good CD4 reconstitution. Now you're gonna ask about the HIV. And so the gentleman sitting here in the front row as we speak is helping Dr. Sakali analyze some of the data on these very patients uh, to look to correlate the, the role of what happens in terms of the virus that's residual uh, in these tissues um, in terms of their correlation with the inflammatory mediators and the gut microbiome. So hopefully we'll have that data for next year. 
We're also interested in the interactions of the immune cells and other particular immune cells that might interact with the microbiome. And we begin to focus, along with Ed Barker in my department, on innate lymphoid cells. Uh, this may be a concept new to some of you in this audience uh, that have not heard about this new part of the innate immune system that has a parallel functions to the T, uh, T helper 1, T helper 2, and, T hel and uh, TH17 cells. So we now know that there are ILC1s that are similar to NK cells in terms of their uh, TH1 production, interferon gamma, and TNF. The ILC2s, like TH2s, IL4, 5, and 15. And I'll focus today on ILC3s because they're important in making IL-17 and IL-22, which, as we heard, are important in epithelial barrier integrity. And what we've uh, looked at here, and I'll just, again, focus here on the ILC3s, um, these are looking at the uh, changes in, in ILC3s here in terms of the frequency of interferon gamma uh, producing cells so that we actually find in the HIV-infected patients a highly significant increase of the ILC3s uh, in terms of their production of interferon gamma as an inflammatory mediator. When we compared then the IL-22 production uh, by the ILC3s, there's no difference. So it's not a loss of IL-22, but when we look at the ratio, it's an overproduction now of these IL-3 populations through the um, uh, elicitation or of interferon gamma. We've also then looked at the frequency of interferon gamma positively correlates with altered microbiome species here in terms of the Prevotella. Uh, and so we can show is the percent of, the, of NK cells as well as the um, ILC subsets, that there's a correlation of the Prevotella species present and this increased production of the uh, interferon gamma in the uh, GI tract. Uh, we also can show that the uh, frequency of IL-23 and IL-1 beta dendritic cells following exposure in vitro goes up with regard to uh, exposure to copri or stercoriae here as, as well. One of the questions was, is what are the mediating events of this? And, and there had been some previous work from Chiara Romagnani's uh, published in Immunity a few years ago that the Roar Gamma T, which are these ILC3 innate lymphoid cells, acquire a pro-inflammatory program upon engagement of the NKP44 receptor. So what you have here are these Roar Gamma T, these are the ILC3s, that express now the NKP44 receptor, and when you engage them with the NKP44 ligand, they now become pro-inflammatory and start to produce uh, more TNF uh, as compared also to IL-22, which is their normal activity. So there is data in the literature to suggest that there is a pathway by which an ILC-3 could become more pro-inflammatory. And what we looked at and what uh, and Ed Barker did was to look at the ligand for NKP-44 in um, infected, uh, uh, from HIV-infected cells. So this just shows the frequency of NKP-44 ligand-expressing cells within um, the uninfected and infected lamina propria. So now these are again using the LPMC model system, infecting them and showing then that in the P24 antigen cells, these are all CD4 cells that have been sorted out, that there's a high degree of upregulation now of NKP44 ligands. So that means that under HIV infection conditions in the gut, you can then enhance this ligand, which I showed you, can engage NP44 present on the ILC3s and drive them then to an inflammatory activity. So our whole model in this regard is the fact that we believe that, again, Prevotella is responsible for uh, activating MDCs. We've shown this in vitro, again, with the Prevotella species, uh, Stercorii, uh, present in the gut of our patients that can activate the myeloid dendritic cells to produce IL-1 beta and IL-23. And these are the two major cytokines that are responsible for driving now ILC3 activation. Uh, we can also show that there uh, is NKP44 expression and the presence of NKP44 ligands that are there that will then drive these cells to produce IL-22 along with, we've shown interferon gamma in this. We've done further work in the lab now with a graduate student uh, in Dr. Barker's lab to show TNF is also produced. So we get both interferon gamma and TNF alpha production by now the ILC3s under these particular conditions that we think are important in inflammatory responses. And we're now beginning to look at other additional signatures, uh, some of the work where we're going to be sorting out ILCs and working in, with some more of the systems biology work with Rafiq in another grant uh, application as well. What I'd like to do then in the final parts of my uh, 
talk is to really focus and, and go into a little bit more about the therapeutic applications and where we think uh, this can go. And, and this is work that we've done in collaboration with Ivana Pendria's lab in Pittsburgh using two different monkey models to look at the role of, of microbial translocation uh, and again, alteration of gut microbiome in the monkey model. So we've been using a, a single viral strain to infect the non-pathogenic African green monkey and then the pigtailed macaque one in which we can induce MT, and in this case, uh, this has been done either through direct LPS administration or through the use of alcohol. So I think all of you, uh, we can all measure everybody after a good evening of caipirinhas or drinking here in Brazil, because one of the best inducers of microbial translocation that we study in the lab is alcohol, and we actually have a number of studies that. Uh, we've also done that in the monkey model as well. And then in the pigtail macaques, which is the pathogenic model, I'll show you the data today on the reduction of MT using a combination of rifaximin and sulfazalazine. Uh, this is a paper that just was published uh, a few months ago in PLOS Pathogens. So this is the data just to show you a combination of sulfazalazine and rifaximin reduces microbial translocation during uh, early SIV, SAB infection. Uh, these are again pigtailed macaques. So these are the uh, untreated animals looking here at plasma. Now I again remind you, these, these monkeys are in, 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 acutely infected and then we treat them with the sulfazalazine and rifaximin at the beginning of their infection. Uh, these are the treated, these are the untreated animals, and showing, again, significant reductions in plasma LPS levels as well as uh, soluble CD14 levels uh, up to, again, here, 100 days post-infection, whereas treatment was stopped here at, at day 40, so we can still see residual effects. We've also, again, done in collaboration, which a Gestes group looked at tissue levels of expression of the uh, microbial translocation products in lymph nodes of the infected PTM. So these, again, on the left are the uh, untreated. On the right, uh, these are, I'm sorry, these are the treated. These are the untreated controls on the right, again, showing you the increase in percent uh, LPS expression by staining the tissues, uh, work done by uh, Jake Estes' lab to show this occurs not only in the systemic circulation, but also significant reduction in LPS expression in tissue. We've also looked at CD4 uh, T cell activation, uh, here measuring uh, by uh, CDDR38 on CD4 cells and CD8, showing significant reductions in activation. I'll again remind you that these animals are only receiving the rifaximin sulfazalazine. They are not receiving any uh, antiviral drugs. And then also some uh, non-significant changes occurred in, in KI67, both the CD4 um, and the CD8. Um, and then finally, looking at the viral load, these are animals only receiving these inhibitors. Again, rifaximin, a non-absorbable antibiotic, sulfazalazine, an anti-inflammatory used in uh, treating inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, and this improves, again, in reductions of viral load uh, in the early phases. Also, maintenance of the uh, CD4 T cells, uh, both uh, in terms of the numbers in the gut and then the index of CD4 T cells quantitated in the gut. So again, we're able to preserve CD4 T cells and show reductions of systemic viral load by only treating, at the again, in the acute phase. So I'll remind you, they're only getting this drug at the time of infection. So this is like treating an acute HIV when you first diagnose them with these drugs and with no antiviral uh, drugs themselves. And we've also gone on to ask directly what happens to the microbiome, which is looked at in here, and we were only able to do this. This was something asked for by reviewers, so we did go back and treat um, animals uh, with rifaximin. Now, these are uninfected animals, just to see whether or not there was truly uh, an effect of rifaximin directly on the primate microbiome. So these are uninfected animals treated directly with rifaximin just to look at what happens in terms of the microbiome. And, and interestingly enough, you do get an interesting uh, an expansion here of the Prevoteliaceae uh, species and then also in terms of the, the microbiome diversity, a decrease as you'd expect in both the richness and the uh, complexity by treating with an antibiotic. So there does seem to be an effect uh, on the activity or the fitness and the complexity of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the actual environment there in the gut of these animals. So what we've done, this was the monkey studies, acute infection. We're able to see some effects. 
Um, and then we said, okay, this is something that may not be as practical in a human trial, and then there are three studies, or at least two studies here, and there's a third study on mesalamine that's also been done by Peter Hunt's group in chronic HIV, and, and Mike Letterman uh, has been a participant in, in, in these studies as well with Savalamir as one of the senior investigators for the ACTG. Uh, in this case, this is an endotoxin binding compound. There was no impact on systemic markers of MT, but again, some effects on reduced LDL and oxidized LDL. And, and you'll hear more about the role of these uh, lipid mo moieties and cardiovascular disease from Dr. Letterman's talk. So I think this raises some interesting questions about the role for um, this effect in, in other aspects of HIV. We also have done a, a rifaximin study, no impact on systemic markers of microbial translocation minimal, if any, reductions to speak of in T-cell activation, and we're now just finishing. We did do a microbiome analysis in the 5286 trial and did not see a significant effect on the, on the human microbiome study, although uh, that study is just being written up and submitted for publication. There has been one study uh, looked at here, I'll just refer to, there have been others in human trials, of a prebiotic uh, called the COPA trial, um, and they did show a reduction in plasma soluble CD14. So with the idea in the human studies, which we wanted to move forward with, that there was no direct effect of these uh, act, uh, inhibitors of, of microbial translocation, we had some thought about thinking more about the role of modulating the human microbiome, and uh, then work came out on the role of probiotics as a potential interaction. Again, to remind you about probiotics, they're beneficial to the host, inhibition of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and they uh, drop and, and restore uh, permeability. They produce the, help produce short-chain fatty acids. And again, they've been used in many different uh, diseases to date. Um, and again, the goal here was how else can we exploit the effects of modulating and effects of the microbiota. And this is work uh, from Jason Brenchley and, and Nikki Klatt, uh, which came out in 2013. So at the time we were thinking about the opportunities, uh, Jason and Nikki were also moving forward in this idea uh, of evaluating this in the primate model. And again, they published this in Journal of Clinical Investigation in 2013. And they showed very nicely in the study that probiotics may increase uh, antigen-presenting cell frequency and function, uh, as is shown here. They also showed in these studies um, that the increase in CD4 T cell reconstitution and decreases in inactivation. So here, KI67 increases in T cells, uh, antivirals. These, these monkeys were on ARVs plus the, uh, the probiotics. And this is a probiotic known as uh, VisBiome or VSL3. So what Nikki was able to show in their studies with uh, her and Jason when she was working at the, NIH, at the NIH was probiotics may enhance immunity by increasing APC function, uh, increased gene expression of APC-associated genes, uh, increased frequency of APCs, again, with CD4 reconstitution and IL-23 production, which might be relevant to driving some of the important cells. Um, that I, I mentioned, IL-23 is important in driving the IL-C3s, and so that in certain cases those would be important in driving cells to make important factors that would block uh, the, or maintain epithelial barrier integrity. Um, they're also enhancing T cell immunity, CD4 T cells, functionality, and turnover, so that these may be a potential for um, supplementation in ARVs. So taking a page from this book, uh, in the ACTG, um, this actual study opened uh, a month ago, so we're now accruing in this study, which is ACTG 5350. So we're now doing a safety tolerability uh, of, a, of the probiotic visbiome on the gut microbiome. Uh, and so this is a therapy trial where we're looking at uh, individuals with, uh, as CD4 immune non-responders. Uh, and this is being led by Adriana uh, Andrade and uh, Turner Overton. Uh, and Jeff Jacobs and Carol Wilson are the vice chairs. We also are doing a sub-study um, here looking at the effects in a tissue of epithelial barrier function, inflammation, and in this case, we're doing sigmoidoscopies on a subset of our patients uh, and, and collaborating with Jason Brenchley's laboratory in order to uh, look at the, the tissue-based analysis 
uh, in these patients, and this is being led by Rachel Presti at WashU and Brett Williams at, at Rush University. So we're now taking, again, what we've learned well from our primate model colleagues and now moving it forward uh, into uh, a, a human study. And hopefully, if I can come back next year, Esper, I can present that by next year we should have good results on this VisBiome study to present to the group. One other uh, concept, I, uh, this again just summarizes why we did this, understand the effects on colonic mucosal histopathology function and barrier. They'll undergo sigmoidoscopy and we're getting biopsies. Again, is having, uh, we're also collecting fecal material. So this again, this will be an important study because I mentioned to you the potential differences that we might be seeing between using tissue-based microbiome versus fecal-based, this study will have both samples available to go back to in an interventional trial. We're also doing other studies in our lab and, and collaborations with Carol Wilson's group in patients who are starting ARV therapies alone, because there's still a question of what effect does the ARV alone have on the microbiome. I just want to end on one last note of, of sort of where the field is going, and one other area, uh, again, some work that's been uh, really uh, the pioneering work of this comes at UCSF from Ma Samsuk, a, a young investigator there, I think, who's done some really elegant work. Uh, Ma is a, a gastroenterologist, and I think it also speaks to the fact, as we begin to get folks from other fields working in the HIV field, uh, as we're thinking about the role of the gut and the gut biology, it's great to work with colleagues in these other fields. And Ma, working with Peter Hunt and Steve Deeks, has really done a great job here. As we know, is this is the area of fecal uh, transplantation. So it's beginning to take a role in the HIV field. Uh, what's the safety in the setting of HIV? Well, it's very safe in the clostridial difficile literature. There's a huge literature here, and, and the first real clinical applications of fecal transplants have been shown to be effective in, in C. difficile. Uh, the question is, um, how can a donor microbiome be stably engrafted? Uh, that's the question. And then if engrafted, can a healthy or standard donor microbiome uh, reduce systemic inflammation? I'm going to show you just some of the preliminary data. I, the first of these studies that Ma has just completed haven't really shown demonstrated proof of efficacy, but again, these are the critical questions that we need to ask. Um, this is a, the study design of Ma's first study. It's a two-arm, unblinded, interventional trial that he's just now completed. Uh, delivered by colonoscopy. Okay, again, how do you deliver your uh, fecal transplant? This is by uh, colonoscopy. The next trials are actually are looking at encapsulation of the material and delivering it orally in the next version of this. And we're actually talking and had a discussion with Ma about a potential for a um, ACTG study. Uh, and again, the HIV patients undergoing routine colonoscopy serve as controls. Um, the source of this, there's actually a company in San Francisco that makes this. So if you too want to get a fecal transplant, uh, you can go to a company called Open Biome uh, that, does, that accumulates these samples from normal donors. And it raises some very interesting questions, I think, from the clinical IRB, and, and it might be an interesting discussion to have, is how do you source a normal donor? Who is normal in terms of the fecal microbiome? I think this is a great, they have literally two or three donors that come in every day to give their fecal samples that they store away to be able to use in these trials. So it does raise some interesting question, and this is just, again, I won't go through all the details here of the donor screening and all the tests they go through, um, and, they, and then they uh, do this. But this is the company, if you're interested in looking them up, that actually has provided this material for the study. And this is just some of the data just to show you, although the overall study did not show efficacy, there were some data that was positive that the FMT recipients exhibited greater compositional changes in their microbiome beyond those observed in the uh, time-dependent control. So there are, again, some hints, but this is a, a early days, first trials in HIV with fecal uh, microbiome transplant. I think it raises some questions. Is this the way to go? Do people want to really do this? Uh, it might be an interesting point we could discuss further here today. Um, I would also... Uh, say that there are other transplants that are being looked at on the female genital tract side. And I don't know if people recently saw one of the Nature Med papers from Domingos Bellows lab uh, at NYU, where they're now looking at giving uh, cesarean, in cesarean section. So children born to mothers of cesarean section, they're giving back the mother's microbiome uh, to the baby feeling that, that when you don't get your mother's microbiome through natural vaginal births, you actually have a higher propensity for more inflammatory diseases in the children. So there's actually, this is being done, it was published in a, a study from Puerto Rico, and a week later a company now has come up 
uh, that was formed in Boston to do this commercially, to provide to uh, the babies of women who have children by cesarean section, giving back their babies the, the mother's microbiome, the vaginal microbiome. So again, some interesting questions about how we're going to be using, I raise this to the audience to make you aware of this, of how the human microbiome might be used in the future and its applications of uh, going forward. So I'd just like to then summarize and conclude through my talk is that dysbiosis alteration persists even in subjects on heart that's been reproduced in our own and a number of studies, increased in pro-inflammatory species, although I wouldn't necessarily call them pro-inflammatory, these species uh, are important in terms of driving perhaps regulatory inflammatory activities. There's increased activation. And then a potential, as we hope we'll see, for interventions. We are looking at other prebiotic sources uh, to modify probiotics. We have trials. I talked to you about the postbiotics and then perhaps combinations, symbiotics, a combination of pre, pro, or post, and then finally the role for fecal transplants. Now just uh, one last summary. One last summary slide here from a nice review from Nikki Klatt uh, was just to show again what happens in the dysbiosis in HIV, pointing out the role of, of butyrate. We didn't talk, or I didn't talk today about IgA. We talked a little bit uh, on the role of antibody earlier today uh, from uh, Barney Graham's talk. And again, the role of mucosal IgA and IgA antibodies had a lot of interest in the vaccine role, I think how it relates to the human microbiome and IgA production in the vaccine world, I think is very much of interest, and I know a field of interest as well, as, as well as looking at the other effects of translocation. I'll just leave folks with the idea that the gut microbiome is very important in many of these outcomes of the non-communicable diseases. As we begin to think about the alterations of the microbiome in the gut, we now there are links to the, to the pulmonary bone gut-brain axis, metabolic, cardiovascular, uh, depression, and cancer. So I think we're going to find more and more outcomes in the HIV, but just in the general fields, in, of, of, there's a lot of work now in cancer. Two very nice papers in science in the last couple of months of how the checkpoint inhibitors in cancer are influenced dramatically by the uh, gut microbiome and how you react to anti-PD-1 or anti-CTLA-4 may be driven by your microbiome. So I think we're going to see more and more the impact of the human microbiome uh, in health and disease. And just finally, um, thank my collaborators. Uh, this is how Rush invests uh, in the last years. This is a billion dollar hospital that we built. You can see it from space as you fly over Chicago. So when you next fly into O'Hare, you can look for this. Looks like a butterfly. Uh, anyways, from Rush University, Ali Keshavarzi and Ed Barker, collaborators, Carol Wilson, Steph Villan, uh, who I'd like to thank, University of Colorado, Jason Branchley, uh, Nikki Klatt from University of Washington, and Ma Samsuk, University of San Francisco. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>